Hello and welcome to Locked Up Living, the podcast which looks at resilience in challenging organisations such as, but not only, prisons and hospitals for mentally ill prisoners and patients. My name is David Jones and together with Naomi Murphy, I present your Locked Up Living podcast. Hi, we're really fortunate to be able to welcome along today our guest, Jan Banning, who is an internationally acclaimed conceptual photographer artist born in the Netherlands to parents of Dutch East Indian heritage. Jan describes his work as artivism and uses striking visual images in efforts to affect change. His documentary photo projects cover an apparently broad range of subjects, although often speak to big socio-political themes of power and oppression, injustice, poverty, and the impact of colonialism and war. Thus far, he's published 14 photo books and his work has been shown in 80 solo exhibitions, including in some of the most prestigious galleries and museums in the world. His photos are featured in innumerable newspapers and publications, including The Guardian, The Independent, The Sunday Times, The New Yorker, Time and Newsweek. I'm really lucky to have met Jan before when I invited him into the FENS unit to speak to the men about his work and the men were really struck by his photographs of men who had been forced labourers working on the Burmese railway which evoked discussions about enslavement, trauma and resilience and for us today uh, this represents a really unusual podcast because we're also trialling um, the use of visuals at the same time in the hope that we're able to simultaneously um, display some of Jan's work on YouTube to accompany um, this this podcast. So really delighted to welcome along Jan today who has a forthcoming exhibition which is focused on the case of an incarcerated woman, Christina Boyer, who's been incarcerated for 28 years. So delighted to have you here today, Jan. Thanks very much for coming along. Well, thanks for having me, Naomi. Hi, Jan. I'm very pleased to meet you. And I've been reading up on your um, background and terribly interested to read that one of your influences was the Mask of Anarchy. Um, and, the, and the line within that, I met Murder on the Way, he wore a mask like Castlereagh, was uh, a rhyme that uh, really resonated with me when I was uh, younger. And of course, I've always remembered it. And of course, one of your other influences that you mention is Kathy Colvitz, um, who's me as museum I've visited many times in Berlin, one of my most favorite artists. I, I, I used to have a, a drawing of hers of a mother holding her child uh, in, my, um, in my consulting room for many years. So I'm very pleased to meet you. Well, likewise, David. Yeah, that's an interesting coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can you tell us something about your latest uh, exhibition and how you came to be inspired to tell Christina's story? Uh, yes, uh, I was working on a project called Law and Order, uh, which came out as a book and, and uh, was shown as an exhibition starting in 2015 in which I was comparing criminal justice systems in four different countries, Uh, in France, in Colombia, in Uganda, and in the United States. And in the context of that, I uh, struggled to get permission to prisons. Uh, As you can imagine, that wasn't easy, but uh, finally I managed to get permission to visit five prisons in Georgia the US state of Georgia. And um, one of those five was the uh, Pulaski State Prison, which is a prison, a big prison for women. Uh, And what I did was I set up a studio, a photo studio inside the prison. And for three days, I photographed uh, women. All in all, I think about some 80 women. Uh, The purpose was, let's say, visually uh, to photograph these people as I would photograph, well, as I would photograph uh, either one of you or or my girlfriend or uh, uh, whoever. Uh, So a um, beautifully lit portrait without any judgment. And the reasoning behind it is that it's my strong belief that Uh, also 
we as supposedly good citizens uh, could in different circumstances and maybe with different upbringing or whatever uh, different uh, mental state uh, could just as well be uh, criminals or commit crimes. So I wanted to bridge that gap. And the other thing I wanted to do was to find out uh, what one can come across when doing a search on the internet. Because I had understood by then that the internet, the presence of, of, of names and information about people could be a strong blockade in their reintegration into society if they ever uh, got out. Um, so I tried to find whatever I could of uh, a number of these women, I think about 45. And one of the last ones I investigated was a woman called Christina Boyer. And there's quite a lot of information about her on the internet. Uh, not necessarily so much under her name Christina Boyer, but more under the name of Tina Resch, which was her uh, um, well, how do you call that? Her, her previous name, let's put it like that. Uh, so I read all of that and I thought the whole case against her was quite fishy. Uh, I have to say that uh, the Department of Corrections in Georgia allowed me to photograph these women, but they did not allow any conversations. And there was actually somebody in the back of the room checking on that. So I could ask the name, the date of birth, uh, and uh, the length of the sentence and the date of the start of the sentence. That was it. Um, so based on that, I put myself behind the computer like a, uh, <laughs> let's say, as an employer uh, and, and uh, who uh, gets a, uh, who has an interview with this person, and then we'll see. We do a background check. So in the case of Christina Boyer, it was clear that she had a life plus 20 year sentence, life with the possibility of parole. Uh, and uh, she was um, convicted of killing her three-year-old daughter on April the 14th, 1992. And it struck me because of course, a woman killing her own daughter, a three-year-old daughter, is something that you start wondering about. What, what happened? What brings a mother to do that, if she's done it? And the more I read on the internet, the more doubt was cast on whether she even did that. Um, and then the, the tragedy of it all hit home. Uh, the huge likelihood that she was inca uh, wrongfully incarcerated after losing her three-year-old child and not even committing that murder herself. So that drove me uh, to investigate a lot more and a lot more. And by now I have like a, I think half a meter high stack of documents. Basically I have all the documents. The, the uh, autopsy report of the daughter, uh, Amber, she was called. Um, the uh, transcripts of the police interviews with her and her boyfriend, who was the only one present when the girl died. Um, transcript of the court cases, psychiatric reports, uh, and uh, over the years, I'm saying over the years because I photographed her and these other ladies eight years ago in 2013. Over the years, um, we have started to exchange emails. Uh, and <laughs> that's become a huge stack also. I recently counted them and the two of us together have exchanged like 1,250 emails now. Um, yeah, so that's how I got strongly involved. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, Christina's story seems somewhat captivating um, because in many ways she could be representative of so many people in the uh, US prison system, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I consider the, 
the book that I'm making, uh, where she's given huge uh, support, and the exhibition, which is going to be shown first uh, early next year in the Dutch Photo Museum, uh, an exhibition which will be under both our names because I consider her to be um, uh, well, an important uh, co-author, um, is, is uh, supposed to be a case study of indeed typical for how the US criminal justice system works. And let me just mention a few things that are very representative, I think. Uh, if we look at uh, our own image of the American criminal justice system based on what we see on TV, uh, in movies, beautiful courtroom, um, lots of wood there, dark wood, and there's the jury and the judge, etc., etc., etc. Well, <laughs> that only applies to 5% of the cases, of the criminal cases, and 95% uh, ends in a plea bargain which is logical because the US is the biggest incarcerator in the world and they have the biggest incarceration rate of all countries. So if all those people would have to be taken to court and, and, and uh, there would be uh, an actual trial with jury, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> I think probably the whole financial system of the US would collapse. So the... Uh, the way it works is basically you, um, the um, prosecutor comes up with um, a very heavy sentence that he's aiming at, and then you offer the suspect uh, a lighter sentence in exchange for, uh, for this plea deal. Uh, and that's what also happened in Christina's case. So she was never really tried. Another, I think, very typical thing which is related to this is that, uh, of course, most of the, <laughs> of the uh, suspects uh, are indigenous people, uh, are poor, so they can't afford uh, a lawyer of their own. So they get uh, a pro bono lawyer. And a lot, a lot of these lawyers are overworked, uh, unmotivated, or simply bad lawyers. So she and many other people have very little confidence in their own defense. So that makes them more likely <laughs> to accept a plea deal. So those are uh, two, I think, very typical uh, things. Mm, yeah, that's very uh, powerful, actually, uh, Jan. And I'm thinking that the, the press also rely on good visual images to tell their stories. Can you say something about the role of the press in criminal justice and how you reflect this within your work? Yeah, let me, let me show uh, a few photographs there. Um, so let's see, let's see, here we go. Uh, and then... Good. Well, we've seen that one. Oh, sorry. This is a bit chaos. Yeah. Uh, so let me say a few words about the um, the visual side of this. Uh, or no, let me let me first start to talk about the indeed the role of the media. Uh, I photographed all relevant pages of the regional newspaper. As I said, the, um, the death of her daughter, Amber, occurred in um, Cattle County, which is, let's say, some uh, 60 miles to the west of Atlanta, the capital of Georgia. Uh, so it's countryside. Uh, and there is a county newspaper which is called the Times Georgian. And they um, published, I think about 85 pages related to this story. Uh, beginning of the geen at the pages related to this story. Hate. Je zou even... <laughs> uh, 
Sorry, <laughs> the computer interferes. <laughs> um, and so beginning with uh, her and the boyfriend being arrested, uh, then mentioning that the, um, uh, the uh, public prosecutor is going to go for the death sentence and, and uh, there are related topics such as the fact that uh, this all happened shortly before the elections of local officials. And you have to take into account that um, in many American states, the public prosecutors, the sheriffs, the judges are elected. And uh, now, but even more so, I think in the 1990s when this happened, there was a strong, a tough on crime atmosphere. So if you wanted to be elected, you certainly had to uh, to make it clear that you were going to be tough on crime. And of course, all the more so <laughs> shortly before the elections. So there is an, a relation, I think, between the position of the DA and the sheriff and the judge, which we can never prove. But in general terms, this has in several parts of the US indeed been proven I mean, statistically speaking, that uh, these, these, for example, the judges in the year of their election are more likely to go for the death penalty. So there's those articles. And what you see is, is kind, you basically see how quickly the hysteria builds up in the media. Um, who do we get to hear? We mainly get to hear the DA and the police. Um, the two suspects, Christina and her then boyfriend, David, uh, well, they, they, of course, there's a lot of publicity about both of them, but there's a strong difference in the sense that Christina was a, an outsider. Christina came from Ohio and had only been living in uh, Carroll County for a couple of months, whereas the boyfriend, uh, was the son of two well-respected uh, nurses in Carrollton, which is a small city, lots of people know them. So the starting point, of course, was, uh, let's say, didn't look too good for the boyfriend. Um, and briefly, what happened is on that fatal day, April 14, 1992, around 12.30, Christina leaves the house where uh, Amber is left with the boyfriend. Uh, there had been a few falls and, and, and bruises, etc., in the previous days. But when Christina checked with her daughter, who normally was very outspoken, the daughter said, I fell, mommy. Uh, and, and on another occasion, again, she said, I fell with my face, rocks in my face. And the explanation of the boyfriend was she fell off uh, uh, small stairs with her head on the um, in the gravel. So it seemed to make sense. Anyway, I mean, it seemed to make sense. Uh, <laughs> she didn't su suspect that the boyfriend had abused the child. And until today, we don't know if he did. Speculation. Anyway, Christina leaves the house uh, just after 12.30. And when she comes back around six o'clock, uh, the boyfriend is kind of panicking. Uh, she drives up uh, the driveway and there's the boyfriend and he's saying, I can't wake Amber up. And she goes to the bedroom and finds her daughter all blue and not breathing and no heartbeat. Um, and they drive to the hospital and that's where the police gets involved. So you would expect, and indeed that was the situation that in the beginning, uh, there was more suspicion uh, pointed towards David, the boyfriend, than towards her. But you see this change rather quickly. Um, and the police seems to play a role in it, but also the, um, the media play a role in it. 
she uh, very quickly starts to be described as a bad mother. Uh, there had been uh, some eight years earlier, some strange events when she was still living in Ohio, uh, paranormal stuff, uh, media attention. Um, and of course, in the Bible Belt, that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, more likely to be related to the devil than to God. Uh, so that didn't give an all too good impression. She was an unwed mother. Then it turned out that she had been, uh, let's say, posing in a, a sexual video of some amateur in Carrollton. Uh, so she must be a horrible woman. And you see the whole suspicion move in her direction. So to, uh, to, 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 to put it briefly, I think there's certainly an aspect, a strong aspect of being tried by media. Um, and yeah, the whole media treatment was, was I think, very uh, superficial. They didn't delve into things. Let me show a few of those photographs, if that works. Yes, it does. <clears throat> so visually speaking, I focused on these articles, but for context, I also showed the other parts of the newspaper and they still, we still have to work a bit on the contrast, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the whole style, the whole approach, the visual approach is, is let's say, uh, um, uh, there's an association with the uh, film noir. Okay, well, that's, um, do you, is there anything else you would want to discuss about the media? Well, I was just reflecting, I mean, she looks so young in that photo, doesn't she? But I was also reflecting how much kind of social norms have changed over time. So the being a unmarried mother, for instance, counting against her at that point in time, where actually things changed quite a lot in terms of society. My guess is, I mean, the way we, the way we view women is women are held up to different standards to men so I guess the posing in the in the soft porn uh, magazine would still have been held against her but some of the harshness of how she was treated will have been reflective of of that era wouldn't it yes I think so yes uh, uh, I, I also think that the um uh, societies there have become less closed. There's more influx of people from outside. So uh, it's probably more enlightened than it was at the time. I was, I was going to question that slightly because one of the things I usually do you know, before I go to sleep is on my uh, tablet flick through the headline pages of many of the uh, daily pa uh, papers coming out the following day. And you could well imagine some of our newspapers like the Express and the Mail, the Star, um, you yeah, know, having similar kinds of um, uh, headlines as we see, as we see here. Although, as you said, there is a particular film noirish quality about many of these uh, headlines, which is more American than uh, British. I should say. Yeah. Yes. Well, of course. I mean, <laughs> it's all relative. Um, it's still countryside. It's still, um, well, I, I'm probably not supposed to say that, but a bit backward, even if you, if you compare it to Atlanta, for example. Um, so, but it's, I think, well, look at the, the um, uh, political situation at the moment. Eh? You saw that, uh, uh, Georgia suddenly made a turn to, uh, I wouldn't say to the left, but certainly to the Democrats. And uh, the Republicans are, are, are kind of in panic to, to limit uh, voting there because it's going in <laughs> the wrong direction from their point of view. So yeah, I think that has changed. On the other hand, this area, uh, Carroll County is still strongly Republican. And um, yeah. But I guess the 
film noir effect of your photos kind of reverses that I suppose what you're you're casting um up is the morality of the press in terms of their involvement and how much power they've had to shape what happens to this woman um in in a way where the the press have focused on the morality of her conduct but actually there's the, the that thing about not throwing stones isn't there um yes i'm not sure to, uh, what exactly the question is but yeah i think so and and uh, of course, they they used certain aspects. Eh? There is one headline uh, saying "sex lies and videotape" when this um, sexual video came up, and then the whole atmosphere becomes something like as if she's she's a semi porn star. This is my goodness! I mean, this is one guy who, in his private home, uh, films her with bare breasts, um, and. Uh, well, how terrible is that? And, and and certainly, how is that related to killing or not killing your daughter? Yeah. Well, I think we've got a member of the Roe family who's had uh, <laughs> some of the photos taken of her, actually. But, uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what happened to you? What happened to her then partner, David? Um, so the DA decided to uh, first handle Christina's case. Uh, as I said, she had a, I don't think necessarily a bad lawyer, but this lawyer had all in all 88 cases at the same time. Uh, and among them, at least one very high profile case, which also has most likely earned him a, a nice sum of money. So he wasn't too motivated, meaning that in the about I think about one and a half or two years he was supposed to be her lawyer. She met him four times. Uh, and uh, the second time, uh, when she wanted to discuss the case, which was very shortly before uh, the, the trial was supposed to open, <laughs> ironically, on Halloween, it was supposed to open, uh, he came up and told her that, uh, no, there's no defense. Uh, I worked out a plea deal with the DA. And um, uh, if you don't take that, I'm off. And of course, there's another aspect. A lot of uh, poor people who are not, uh, let's say, really brilliantly educated uh, have little clue of how the justice system works. So in her perception, that meant that she would be alone in the courtroom without defense. Uh, the DA would uh, ask for the death penalty and uh, she would immediately after judgment be taken out and put on the electric chair, which is not how it works, but hey, she didn't know. Anyway, so she took this plea deal and well, I'll not get into the details of that, but it was a very absurd form of plea deal in which basically she said, I will... Um, I'm not going to admit that I'm guilty. I didn't beat my daughter dead, but I accept the sentence. Uh, strange uh, thing. Anyway, so that was done. And then David was taken to court. And during his trial, which was um, three months after she took the plea deal, uh, all kinds of things came to the surface, uh, which cast strong doubts on her being guilty. Uh, to mention one thing, uh, I think I said that she, uh, her sentence was life plus 20 years. <clears throat> the 20, <clears throat> sorry, the 20 years was for uh, beating, uh, mainly um, injuring her pancreas, uh, obviously her daughter's pancreas. Uh, during David's trial, the medical specialist uh, who um, reported this originally uh, testified that while the pancreas, it was, uh, it would have healed by itself. There was nothing serious. <laughs> okay, so she gets 20 years extra for the, an injury which will heal by itself. Um, 
So uh, anyway, the final result is uh, that David is sentenced to 20 years, not for murder, most likely because they already have somebody convicted of the murder. So that's been solved. So he's convicted for cruelty to children. And after 19 and a half years, he's been released. And he is now living in Carrollton again. He's been married and uh, uh, probably is keeping a low profile. He doesn't want to discuss this whole case with anyone. Uh, but he's free. He's been free since 2011. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, Christina has been locked up now for uh, about, well, over 29 years by now. Thank you. Naomi? Um, could, could you say something about the credibility of the professionals involved in a conviction as well? I mean, you've spoken about um, the having a pro bono lawyer, but it sounds, I think from our conversations previously, it sounded like there were other questions about the credibility of, of some of the people that were involved in her case, like the judge. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you could say that. I mean, when I started to delve into that, I really didn't believe it. I thought if you would put this in a movie, and people would say, come on, come on, that's not credible. So let me let me try to remember uh, at least most of these. It's almost undoable. Um, the judge uh, later on was uh, forced to resign for what's it called judicial, um, well, let's say faults, but it was more like corruption. Um, what else do we have? Yes, when Christina was taking this Alfred plea, when she decided to take it, she was heavily medicated, uh, which basically she didn't know. She thought she was getting antidepressants, but it turns out that what she got was uh, antipsychotic medication and much too, uh, much too strong. The doctor who uh, administered these, uh, this medication was later on uh, sentenced to, I think, 25 years for illegal distribution of prescription medicine. Um, then, after she had taken the plea, uh, people uh, managed to find money, found a second lawyer uh, to do a habeas case. Uh, I don't know, is that, is that something that you're familiar with? Habeas corpus. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's not used so very much here. Yeah, basically it's... it's um, trying to prove that she's that she's wrongfully incarcerated. Uh, let's put it like that. That's the simplest uh, thing. Um, she lost that. The second lawyer later on also ended up in prison uh, for sex with minors. I think he's been convicted to to ten years. You know, it it becomes blurry after a while because there's so many. Uh, several of the parole officers who, uh, the parole board members who were judging on her parole uh, were forced out of their role or, or even put in prison uh, for different things. For example, one guy who was uh, the chairman of the parole board and, and then became the commissioner of prisons in Georgia uh, on one occasion entered uh, a prison with a bunch of goons that started to smash up prisoners and, and blood all over the place. And in the end, the state of Georgia was uh, convicted to paying damages to these prisoners. Um, there's, there's more, but I... <laughs> well, it, it just seems so... Um... Like a list. Well, that, well, that's it. It's really striking. It's, you know, and it, is this just kind of like a set of really uh, improbable but unfortunate coincidences? Or is, the, is that a reflection of the degree of corruption and rot within 
within the system and I, I suppose is this something that's uniquely possible in America or could you see this kind of thing happening in other countries? That's a difficult question Naomi because I have been really absorbed by this case. I'm not a criminologist who specializes in, in the criminal justice system in the United States or elsewhere. Um, and well, according to things I heard, for example, from uh, a lawyer, a Dutch lawyer who's been active in Louisiana, uh, it's not unusual to put it, let's put it like that. Um, it's, it is and certainly was very much an old boys network, people protecting each other. And then every once in a while, they had the bad luck that some person with more integrity <laughs> came into an important position and then they got into trouble. Um, I cannot really imagine that. Well, look, a lot of other people had to deal with these same persons. Uh, the judge, for example, this is not just because he was corrupt, that was the problem. Uh, the guy was, was known to, to take naps in, in court. I mean, how, how could a judge is that? <laughs> what kind of an interpretation of your role is that? Um, but I cannot really make a strong case in, 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 in this. That's, that's, that's fine, thank you. I was wondering um, how easy it's been to create a compelling visual experience when the person at the centre of the story is in prison. Well, that's a good question, yeah. As you've seen, I portrayed her once, the photograph that we have shown at the beginning of, the, um, of this programme uh, was made in prison. Uh, since then, I have time and time again asked for permission to enter the prison again and to see her uh, as a member of the media with introductory letters of um, print media, uh, as an artist with an, a letter of introduction of the Dutch Rijksmuseum, and it never worked. And finally, and fortunately, in late 2019, I found kind of a, <laughs> let's call it a back door, uh, so that I could visit her again. But certainly not with any equipment. There's no way I can photograph again. The commissioner of prisons, who at the time in 1993 gave me permission, uh, has gone. There's another um, commissioner of prisons who seems to be much less, even less open. Uh, but it's not just that, it's also that <clears throat> uh, normally I work in a documentary style. So let's say the existing reality is, is my starting point. But if you look at a case, uh, at something that happened uh, when I started uh, more than 25 years ago, I mean, <laughs> I started more than 25 years after the events after 1992, 1994, when Amber was killed and the, and the, the trial was ongoing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, so much has changed that it doesn't make much sense. The apartment where Christina lived has been demolished. The trailer of her boyfriend, where Amber died, uh, has gone, and there's a, a totally new trailer there. Uh, many of the people involved have died and are. <laughs> And not very keen on collaborating anyway. Um, the buildings have changed. The, the hospital has been completely uh, modernized. Uh, the jail has been uh, completely rebuilt. Uh, so it seemed to me that there were only two options. One option was uh, what we in Holland would call this this approach of guilty places where you go back and which you see for example in some photo series about the first world war where people go to Verdun or the Somme or whatever and there's a landscape and you see well, I don't know what corn growing or you see a farmer on a tractor or you see nothing and there's a field and that's where the drama happened but the photograph has zero drama uh, which which can be interesting, but I was kind of fed up with that approach. And certainly here I thought, ah, that's nothing. And because um, 
let's say the aspect of subjectivity and objectivity is such a big thing here. Uh, we look at the newspapers where, well, what exactly is true, what is not true. We look at what was being said uh, by the police, by the DA, um, uh, and also, of course, what Christine herself says, although I very much tend to believe her and see her as a very honest person, it is subjective, obviously. So I thought maybe it makes sense to, for myself to also give a subjective interpretation of things that happened. Uh, and also, uh, that's basically the last part of this book. I'll, I'll show a bit of that. Uh, I invited Christina to add uh, her subjective, uh, uh, to give her subjective input. Uh, so shall we look at uh, some of the images? That would be great, yes, please. Yeah. Um, well, this... Uh, why this doesn't work is always a mystery, of course. Oh, okay, there we go. Yep, well, this is a good example. Let's show. Yes. Uh, can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Good, good. So, what you see here, I don't know how well you can see it here, but uh, we have developed such a strong um, confidential relationship that she allowed me to first read and then also use uh, pages from her diaries uh, in the period between her arrest and uh, the, uh, the plea deal. Uh, provided that I show her the pages that I selected. So I've selected, um, what I think, 16 or so double pages from these, the two and a half years uh, diaries. And that's one of the inputs. So you're not going to read that now, but it gives you an idea, of course. Huh? And it's, it's very moving. Actually, she is, she's a good writer. Uh, maybe not in the literary sense, but um, in few words, she can express things with a lot of impact. Uh, it's, it's emotional, it's poetic, it can be philosophical, and it's, it's very open. And you have to remember that, of course, these diaries were not meant to be read by anyone. So this is one of the two aspects of her subjectivity. Uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll keep it to just one example. I also include some uh, photographs from her private uh, collections. And this for me is a very moving uh, example. It's a Polaroid of her and her daughter, uh, not so long before Amber died. And uh, as you can see, Amber has been, has been drawing on this. Um, and one of the things that struck me and that I've incorporated in the whole series is the importance of the color pink, which of course is very much a, a, a young girl's color. Uh, and Amber was probably not the only one whose favorite color was pink, but she loved to, to wear pink. And even here you see that she's drawing with pink. So I use this color pink a lot in the, um, in the whole series. Uh, but let's go to the, um, uh, the interpretations that I mentioned. So what I did was partly, I mean, this is Amber's grave. And we've had a lot of correspondence about these photographs. Uh, some of them are completely inspired by what Christina told me. And others like this one, for example, I photographed again in this kind of film noir style uh, with lots of contrast between uh, light and dark. 
uh, and with every photograph that I made, uh, I, I checked it with her. It's not like asking for permission, but I was curious because she is such a interesting woman. And maybe this is the right moment to say that although this whole project started based on, on pity and empathy, because it seemed so horrible to me that a woman has to first lose a child and then wrongfully be put in prison for that for decades. But through the years, she has become a much rich, richer person for me. She has so much to say. So I wanted to have this exchange also. And here, for example, her interpretation, she's a very religious person, which I'm not. Uh, she was really grateful for this photograph because she said it's almost like the light of God is shining on the grave of Amber. And um, yeah, I thought that was very moving. Well, this here, so this is all, uh, this for example is, is recreated. So what I did was I looked at the circumstances in the, uh, the back garden of the, um, where the original trailer was, where Amber died. And uh, what you see here is also related to my research. So I also tried to figure out if maybe there had not been any murder at all uh, because of the descriptions that everyone gave of the boyfriend. Even Christina herself, she said, uh, very laid back guy, very relaxed, uh, very patient, which made me wonder would such a person actually suddenly explode and kill a three-year-old girl? That's, that's strange. Um, and by then it was clear to me that Christina couldn't have done it uh, based on, on all kinds of research that I also did here in Holland and in Belgium, etc. I spoke to, to medical uh, specialists. Um, so I started to investigate, could it be that because of the falls on previous days, uh, maybe there was a slow, they had a slow impact. And here, for example, one of the stories was that she fell off her tricycle uh, and got the steering wheel in her stomach. And could it be that that was the cause of the pancreas injuries? So this photo was uh, inspired by that. And the, the, the way I photographed it was inspired by um, the original back garden, backyard of the, um, of the trailer. And then I, um, I bought a, um, a tricycle and put it there and used the light, et cetera, et cetera. So it's totally subjective. This is, well, obviously it's real. I mean, there's no, 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 no Photoshop manipul manipulation involved, but uh, it's, it's, it's not documentary. And this is my interpretation of the, uh, the bed and the room uh, in that trailer uh, immediately after they picked up Amber and drove off to the hospital. And again, you see here the use of pink. <coughs> I've long been struggling with what do I do with the shadow? Uh, should I use a human shadow? But at that point in time, I was still unsure whether it was actually whether it was actually murder and possibly an accident. So I wanted to have a more abstract shadow, which gives a kind of, of dark atmosphere, but does not point the finger at a human being. Well, maybe we don't have the time to delve into all of that, but I can just briefly say, so this is a hospital room. I went in search of such a hospital room, which had a 1990s atmosphere based on what Christina told me about uh, her and David waiting in the hospital to see if they could resuscitate Amber. And again, there's uh, this pink, the pink flower, which happened to be there. But this is a, a deserted hospital uh, all the way in the south of Georgia. 
This is the new jail. In the back of this, Christina was locked up. It's still kind of visual, but this jail is named after the sheriff who arrested her and who unfortunately for him died several years afterwards because he was killed by his own lawnmower. And here's an interpretation of the um, jail cell, which again is not the original jail cell. Um, this is the uh, huge psychiatric institute where uh, Christina was uh, under observation for a couple of weeks to see if she was uh, mentally able to stand trial. And again, I like this confusion. I mean, what you see here is partly real branches and partly just a shadow of branches, uh, which again takes in this, this <laughs> what's real, what's unreal, what's real, what's true. And this year, I still have to do a bit of, uh, I have to make a few changes. This is, is like kind of the bureaucratic monster, which is, um, well, puking out is maybe not the word, but, but <laughs> exporting the, um, uh, the demand for the death sentence. And this finally is a photograph, which again, was, this was totally inspired by Christina, who told me at one point that uh, if she would ever get out, she would want to build uh, a small altar for her daughter, for Amber. And she mentioned a few things like the angel and uh, the candle and this locker with um, uh, Amber's photograph in it. And then I proposed to Christina, well, how about I try to photograph that altar? So we exchanged a bit and, and this is the result. You know, where again, you, can't, you certainly can't see it on screen, but when you look at the flowers, these four flowers, uh, three of them are artificial, are well done, but they're artificial. And the fourth is the real one, which is, is what's that in English? Well, the one which is <laughs> dying basically. Mm -hmm. Um, again, pink, the three and a half is, is, is referring also to Amber um, being three and a half years old when she died. Anyway, so I try to bring layers of, of, um, of the story and of emotional impact into it. Yeah, very striking images, uh, Jan, thank you for sharing thank those. You. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, beautiful pictures, very reminiscent of, you know, the, the Dutch Grand Masters. Indeed. Yeah, interesting that you say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. You're a, a high profile internationally recognised artist. Does that make it easier to overcome some of the barriers that people encounter when they're trying to attract attention to important causes like, like Christina's? Yes. Yes, it certainly helps. Um... It's, uh, yeah, it basically makes it easier to attract attention in many ways. Uh, some examples. Um, since I started uh, to actually, uh, let's say, to work as an artivist, uh, meaning to combine making art and trying to get Christina released, uh, that was in May 2018. Since then, I've been in Georgia, I think, five or six times. And on each occasion, I try to uh, give lectures. So you can imagine it's easier to be invited in, uh, certainly, for example, arts departments of universities there, uh, but even uh, political sciences, um, uh, journalist education, uh, people take you more seriously and they assume you have something to say about uh, based on the work I've made. Uh, I have um, uh, relations with media in different countries uh, and uh, I have um, a lot of people who like my work. And actually one of the things that I wanted to do was to, I wanted to involve more people like, to what extent can you turn this into a, a small movement? Um, 
because at some point it became clear to me that uh, a lot of people have the urge to do something, to contribute. And what happened was, for example, that uh, after a while, uh, I was contacted by a, a Dutch radio maker, Katinka Beer, who proposed to make a podcast about it, uh, which she did. And the podcast became a huge uh, success. I mean, within uh, 24 hours after its launch, it was the best um, uh, the most popular podcast here in Holland and a few days later also in Belgium, which led to uh, TV programs, radio programs in both countries inviting either us or me to talk about it. But also it led to uh, lots of people emailing me or sometimes phoning me and saying, look, oh, wow, I want to do something. And in the beginning, I didn't really know what to say. I said like, well, please send Christina a postcard or send her an email or a letter or whatever, because she feels totally forgotten as in the case of lots of people who've been incarcerated for a long time, they lose the connections, they lose their social network. And after a while, there's hardly anyone who still cares about them. Uh, and they feel totally forgotten and, and, and the world will go on without them. Uh, so that's what I proposed. But now people have become involved also in organizing lectures. Um, so, uh, well, uh, one example last year when she came up for parole again, I just wrote one email to people, uh, let's say in my own network, saying, look, would you be willing to make it clear to the parole board that she does have a support network, that she is not alone, uh, even though it's from abroad, but I mean, people can support her financially, whatever. So the final result was that we had some, I think, 230 uh, people who gave their name, their phone number from, if I'm not mistaken, 15 countries. Uh, so we have... Uh, a famous Dutch writer, a well-known Dutch musician, academics, professors, but also uh, somebody who defined herself as a housewife, a bus driver. So it's, it's, I think it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. From all ranges of society, she gets this support. And recently again, in the, I know by now that in the, the month uh, in April, when her daughter died, it's always a very difficult period for her. So again, I invited people to, um, well, if they felt like it, to write like a support message. And again, there were uh, far over 100 support messages and we turned them into a little booklet, which we sent and which fortunately even arrived uh, with the idea that if she feels depressed again and alone again, that she has this booklet and can, like a kind of proof people at least take the trouble of doing this. They they care about me. Um, so I'm not really sure if that's what you were referring to, but yeah, in that sense, it helps. I mean, I do, do have that network. I have lists of people in, in, in different countries. So, yeah. You know, you can hear, really hear your kind of like energy around supporting her and thinking, you know, how lucky she has is to have somebody who's, working that hard to provide her with connection also the support and trying to challenge her case and thinking how many other people might be in positions like her without that and how hard that must to, to have hope and to keep going um, really when faced with with all of that. True but and that is also a point that Christina is making is oh my goodness if they would indeed let me out of prison that's what I want to, I want to be, to become an activist for those people because they don't have a young, and I'm not the only one, eh? mind you, there's, there's lots of other people and they don't have that. So yeah, you're right. Mm. And Christina's story isn't the only time your work has pursued themes relevant to criminal justice, is it? I mean, you referred to your law and order work. How, how did you become interested in that in the first place? Um. You could say in the, in the beginning, it was kind of a rational thing. Uh, in 2008, I had finished a project which is called Bureaucratics, 
which is about bureaucracies in, in eight different countries all over the world. And uh, then a few years later, I thought, well, now I've basically covered the, the executive power, but of course we have the, how do you pronounce that in English? Trias politica, is that how you would say it? The, um, the executive, the legislative and the uh, judiciary. So the three pillars. And I thought, okay, maybe it's interesting to now delve into the judiciary, which for me translated into uh, how, how do we, I mean, as a society and as societies, uh, handle crime. Um, so I decided to delve into three aspects, the police, which technically is not part of the judiciary, but still, I mean, of course, it's <laughs> involved in preventing or fighting crime. Um, the courts and the prisons, which in basically all countries in the world, uh, as far as I know, are used as the, the, the sanction for committing a crime or supposedly committing a crime. Um, so it started kind of rational, like, okay, let's do that. And again, I benefited, I think, from my own work because I didn't know anything about, uh, about law. I studied history, not law. Uh, but I found a, uh, a professor here at the university in Utrecht who was willing to give me private courses in exchange for my books. So uh, <laughs> we would sit together and he would teach me the basics of international criminal law. And after each session, I would hand him a photo book <laughs> <laughs> till the point where he said, well, yeah, I think uh, now you need um, somebody else to discuss that. And he brought me into contact with uh, one of the Max Planck institutes in, uh, in Germany, in Freiburg, which... Uh, focuses on international criminal law. And that was very interesting. And in fact, the director of that institute wrote an introduction about art and the academic world in the book of law and order. So they were very helpful and they gave me a huge stack of literature. And, and I always want to start a project by, by, by reading about, about it. I don't want to just jump in and not have a clue what it's all about. And of course, also, if you want to make choices, for example, in which countries are you going to do this, then you have to, you have to gather knowledge somehow about this whole thing. So anyway, I spent uh, an entire uh, holiday, very luxurious, I have to say, next to a swimming pool with this huge stack of printed PDFs and articles from the Max Planck Institute. And that just grasped me totally. And, uh, unfortunately, I'm not a believer in an afterlife or reincarnation, but otherwise I would plan to become a criminologist in my next life. It's so fascinating. Anyway, so by then it went down from the head to the heart. Uh, and uh, in, 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 well, ad advised by this Max Planck Institute, I selected these four countries. Uh, so there's two uh, countries that have systems based on common law, two that have systems based on civil law, two are, uh, have a colonial heritage, two are original. In the case of common law, maybe it would have made more sense in a way to start in the UK, but I thought it was a strong argument that uh, a considerable number of states in the US have the death penalty and Again, that's of course, or again, that's the most radical <laughs> approach to crime. So anyway, that's how I ended up in the US. And um, it, was, it was really a nightmare to get the permissions. It was, it was just absolutely horrible. Uh, but I managed uh, sometimes in the case of France, it took me two years. In the case of the US, it took me almost two years uh, in the case of Colombia, I never really got what I wanted. And in the case of Uganda, they were as transparent as you can imagine. I could go anywhere, everywhere what I wanted, which was an interesting surprise. 
Yes, an interesting contrast. It was, I, it was also um, enjoyable to hear your anecdote about um, exchanging knowledge for your books, which again is perhaps another example of how being an internationally acclaimed artist opens doorways that other people might not have. True, yes, it's true. It makes life easier, yes. So I do benefit from decades of uh, working in this field, yeah. Thank you, Jan. Um, you've mentioned the work which you refer to as the bureaucratics, and, and I was looking this morning at a, a picture of a woman sitting at a desk with a, a mountain of manila folders behind her, which I think was part of that project. And I, I gather from what you've been saying that this represents some of your thoughts about the executive, um, I guess, can you say some more about that uh, project? Yeah, I can, but let me let me uh, find the photograph because that should be very easy and it's it's funny, I think. So um, we have mainly talked about um, uh, really serious and heavy stuff, but this is kind of funny. So uh, I probably we're not sharing screen now, are we? Not at the moment, no. no. No, okay, let me share that then. Uh, well, where are you? Yeah, I think we'd planned a, a conference last year and we'd, we'd invited um, Jan over to um, to talk about his work, the bureaucratics, because we just thought that that would resonate a lot with people who work within the criminal justice system. <laughs> yeah, I bet, yes. Well. <laughs> yes, I mean, that's, it. That's, that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Well, getting into your remark, David, I, I guess you could, in a way, call this my revenge on bureaucracy. Because, <laughs> as you can imagine, with all these difficult topics, I have been struggling with permission so often just to get back to them. Now, I have to say that I did not, I think most of these photos are, are funny. But I did not try to make a fool of the people involved, but I certainly did try to joke around with the system. I mean, I'm certainly an anarchist at heart, if not more than just at heart. So it was nice to take on this, um, yeah, this part of the political system and to joke around a bit. And if anyone's listening to this just on audio, it's definitely worth checking out this visual image. Yeah, it's a whole series. I think all in all, it's 60 or 65 photographs from bureaucrats uh, in, in, in what is it, for example, in India and China and Texas and France and Yemen and uh, Liberia. Uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> And of course, my fantasy is that all the cupboards are empty um, and all the files are on top of the cupboards here. Um, so. Well, <laughs> that depends on how you look at it. Here's certainly, in some cases, yes. And what, what in some countries, the higher uh, the position of the bureaucrat, the emptier the, 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 the cupboards are. And if you're really high, you have nothing because you don't have to work. You're the boss. <laughs> you are. You don't do. Uh, here, well, they're empty in the sense that a lot of it has been eaten by rats and mice. Um, and, and this is not just a metaphor. I mean, uh, on, at some point, uh, the writer, Will Tinemans, and I were talking to the um, highest bureaucrat of the state of Bihar in India, the state secretary. And during the conversation, actually, a mouse walked over our shoes. <laughs> so, um, and here, yes, we, uh, I mean, we were very uh, eager to work, much more so than most of these people. So we would ask, what time do you start work? And they would nicely say nine o'clock. And then you enter the building at nine o'clock. There's nobody there. There's, I'm not exaggerating. In, in a corner, for example, there's a dog peeing in one of the offices. Uh, and then it's crawling with, with rats and mice. And by the time people come, of course, they, they look for cover. 
But again, this is, of course, the absurdity of rules. I mean, they, there's a rule that you have to keep these papers for so and so long, but nobody says you have to keep them without them being eaten by rats and mice. Yeah, we're, we're going to be interviewing shortly uh, David Boyle, the author of Tick Box, which is all about bureaucracy. I'd be really interested to um, get his perspective on your, on your photos. I would, uh, <laughs> I would certainly uh, be interested to hear his comment, yes. <laughs> but more recently, Jan, you've been trying to increase traction and work cross-culturally to help societies find more compassionate solutions to criminal justice. Could you tell us a bit about your project, the Holland America Line? Yes. Um, I think about uh, eight, nine months ago, uh, I was approached by uh, a fellow photographer who said, um, there's a guy I've just photographed and I think you have to meet him. Uh, he's a retired, just recently retired um, a prison, sorry, prison warden. And I think you, well, you have to meet. So I went to visit him and this guy is bloody interesting. Well, oh, to, to mention this one thing which surprised me uh, and I think I'm not the only one who has some cliches uh, about a prison um, a warden. Well, this guy had been in the municipal council for the uh, left-wing socialist party, uh, which is not my first idea with a prison warden. And interesting also, he's very much against prisons. He considers them to be ridiculous institutes, uh, which are not good, not productive, and uh, yeah, we, we agreed on so many points. Um, and for me, there was this, um, there was also this idea involved, as I said earlier, I've been giving lectures in, in the US, in Georgia, on, on universities, etc. cetera. Uh, and what I would really like to do is ha have lectures where you could get uh, local politicians, people working in the prisons, DAs, lawyers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I thought, yeah, well, I mean, there's this artist who's going to tell those stories. Well, what authority does this guy have? I mean, maybe he makes nice photographs, but uh, is he going to lecture us about our work? That's ridiculous. There's no credibility in that. So when I um, discovered. Franz Dau, this, this prison, um, uh, prison warden, uh, and especially after I heard that he was <laughs> involved in similar situations as I was with Christina. I mean, he has very intense contact with two uh, lifers in, uh, in the US. I thought, wow, this could be the solution. I mean, if only we can now get... Um, lectures or whatever presentations in the US and there's actually a guy who has decades of practice with prisons of course he has much more credibility this must be it so uh, well then uh, corona was already happening so this is not the ideal time to really do that uh, but I hope to be in the US again in, um, in September and uh, yeah, I hope to be able to set these things up. And so ideas that are going through my head is like, I hope that this exhibition will go to the US. I think it's even more necessary that it gets shown there than it is shown here in Holland. Um, now, if we could use that exhibition as we will do here in Holland as a kind of starting point for presentations, discussions, et cetera, et cetera. And we need this guy, this Franz Dao has to be there. So, <laughs> so we both, uh, let's say, uh, contacted our network. And of course, all these people are ridiculously busy and have little time, but that's okay. I mean, they're willing to collaborate uh, and we can approach them with practical things. They're not going to be a, a think tank because they simply don't have the time for that. But if it's like, okay, we need a contact there um, uh, or uh, can you introduce us to somebody there, then they are supposedly... Uh, open to that and, and, and helpful. So um, it's a very informal group of people, uh, which uh, still has to lead to results. And we were waiting for Corona to stop. Um, but yeah, let's hope that works out.
It'll be really interesting to see how that how that pans out with all that energy, um, with the creativity and the knowledge um, after after the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so we look forward to hearing more about that. But finally, Jan, um, we're drawing to a close. Now, a lot of your work has involved telling very painful, somewhat traumatic stories, some of which have got very close personal relevance for you. This kind of work is an emotional burden and can take its toll on someone's well-being. How have you managed to protect yourself and keep yourself healthy across such a productive career? <laughs> well, first of all, every once in a while, um, uh, I cry tears. <laughs> But I'm a, I think I'm a ridiculously optimistic person. So um, I think my character just helps. And it is never totally one dimensional. Um, as I said earlier about Christina, this is she is such a fascinating person and she is not just bringing across um, misery and depression and bad luck. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom. There's, there's so much positive energy also coming from her. Uh, or let me give another example. When I was doing this series about comfort women, which is, uh, I don't know if, if, if people are familiar with it, but these are women who during the Second World War were forced to basically be sexual slaves for the Japanese army in the occupied areas in China, Korea, Indonesia, the Philippines, etc. And uh, some uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, together with a writer, I did a project about Indonesian comfort women. Um, so that was very emotional. But even then, uh, there were moments of, of fun and intimacy. I, I remember with one of these women who was really my, my favorite person, we were joking, and this may sound ridiculous, uh, but we were joking about uh, she was going to come to Holland and, and marry me and stuff like that. I mean, there's there's always also another side, there's also fun. It's not just simply pure depression, even though in some cases, that's the, the, the story that comes out of it because that's what's, what is the topic, what's, what's the subject matter. But in between the lines, there's always other things happening, uh, which, are, which are nice and, and well, given an optimistic nature as I have, I guess you pick up on that. It was really interesting, I think, to hear you talk about tears, for instance, because I think that's something that doesn't get much spoken about. I think actually about, you know, emotional authenticity does involve allowing yourself to actually feel the feeling and in order to be able to let it go at times rather than squash it down and, and pretend it's not happening. But also it was really nice to hear you talking about the repercussions. I can't say it. Re re the reciprocal, the yes, the re I'm not going to attempt it again. The <laughs> reciprocal nature of the relationships between you and the people that you're engaging with and actually about, about how the enrichment they bring to your life as well. And it's really nice to have that acknowledged. But, you know, it's been so great of you to share so much of your time and to also share your images with us today and also being willing to be a guinea pig for us on using YouTube for, for at least one of these podcasts. So thank you so much um, for everything for today. You're most welcome, both of you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Um, good luck with it. Brilliant. Great to meet you, Jan, and uh, excellent conversation. Many thanks again to all of you who have listened to our Locked Up Living podcast. Feel free to mention this to your friends and to your colleagues and give us feedback on our webpage lockeduplives.com and our Twitter account Locked Up Living. Many thanks too to Pete and Rach who kindly allowed us to use their music. You have called me Courage and this is available from all the usual outlets.